Christmas. I'm here at home this morning, but wherever you are, thank you for being with us and thank you for joining in this time of worship and encouragement. Today is known as Palm Sunday as we begin to go through the events leading up to Easter. I've still got my palm cross from last year here and uh, I'm going to keep it in a prominent place this week. This is our second week of live streaming on a, a Sunday morning and our tech guys are looking slightly more relaxed uh, than last week. So hopefully the glitches are getting a bit less week by week. I hope I haven't spoken too soon. We're all getting used to this new normal, not just on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week, which for most of us means being at home. Some of us expect surviving the experience well, um, but for some it's bringing real stresses and strains, I know. And then there are those of you who are key, week, key, key workers with all of the pressures that, that that's bringing to. So uh, for all of us, there are the concerns and the anxiety for our loved ones and for those who we know might be struggling or ill at the moment and for the world as a whole. Over the last 48 hours, uh, Psalm 131 has been brought to me several times. So I'm gonna be just begin by reading it. It says, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord now and always. A picture of someone with a simple trust in Jesus, not necessarily understanding everything, but simply putting themselves in that place of assurance and love. So I invite you to simply come this morning and make that choice to lean in to our Father God and receive his love and his assurance. So let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are sovereign. And we can simply come to you, lean on you, and receive your love and your peace. And I pray that we can do that now. Holy Spirit, come into every home listening in as we invite you at this time. Father, we open our hearts to receive from you and give you our praise. Amen. Now, before Beth brings us another instalment of Narnia, followed by the Stafford family leading us in some actions, Joe Wick style, uh, can an action, action song count as your daily exercise? Anyway, before all that, we've got our weekly life in lockdown. And this week, we've asked Open Table to put together a picture of what life in lockdown looks like for them. This is a community that's for people who enjoy good music and good gardening. Hello, everybody. We're Open Table. Hello. Hello. Open Table met up via Zoom after enjoying the morning worship live from St George's Homes. And we even joined in with the action songs. No, no, no. The earlier part of the week saw wintry gales blowing in from the north, so it was time to hunker down with Monty the cat, get out those jigsaw puzzles, and do something unusual that you wouldn't normally do. During our social distancing, there was time for some composition. Saxophone practice. and trying to keep the dog entertained. And with the wind still blowing, it was time to fix that shed roof. But as the week progressed, spring arrived, and the tortoises came out of hibernation. We could now mow that grass sort out the compost heaps and dig up those pesky weeds. 
although there might have been time for a bit of relaxation and a spot of exercise, the phones had to be answered. The chase had to be edited and the patients had to be scanned. Outside the sun was still shining and it was time to get down to the allotments and start preparing the soil. But it was Stephen Ball who pulled out all the stops performing his very own allotment entertainment special. Down on my allotment there's vegetables and flowers I've planted every one of them and stayed there hours and hours I've got a little shed where I can make a cup of tea Down on my allotment it's the only life for me Carrots, cauliflowers, onions and peas Courgettes, Brussels sprouts, squash and winter greens Tulips, daffodils, marigolds and stocks Sunflowers, violets, daisies, hollyhocks <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thank you so much to Open Table for that life after lockdown, that was great My name is Beth and I've been going through our all age thoughts which we've been looking at Narnia so the first week we looked at the magician's nephew, then the lion, the witch and the wardrobe, and today we are looking at the horse and his boy. And in this part of the story, we have met a slave boy called Shasta. He is lost, and he doesn't know where his friend, the talking horse, Bree, has gone. So, it's probably about two o'clock in the morning, and he's very lost in the middle of the desert, and he comes across some very eerie looking tombs that are very, very tall and have really frightened him. And so he's very smart and he decides to look towards the tombs with his back to the sand so that he can see if anything dangerous is gonna harm him. As he's done that, a very small cat has come and curled next to him and it's provided him with lots of comfort and a bit of warmth and made him feel a bit calmer about the situation. But just as he's starting to get off to sleep, he hears some very eerie, high-pitched noises from the desert. And it turns out they're the noise of a jackal, which is a bit like a dog. They're very tall, very strong, and they've got very, very long teeth. I wouldn't want to meet one if I was on my own. But just as he's heard this, against the moonlight, he sees a big, shaggy head on four legs. It lets out a giant roar, which scares the creatures who've been making the noises but then Shasta worries that it's turned to look at him. And this is where we join in the story. It's a lion, I know it's a lion, thought Shasta. I'm done. I wonder, will it hurt much? I wish it was over. I wonder, does anything happen to people after they're dead? Oh, oh, here it comes. And he shut his eyes tight and his teeth tight. But instead of teeth and claws, he only felt something warm lying down at his feet. Now, anybody at home, I wonder if you can guess what that something warm at his feet might have been. It was indeed the cat that had provided him comfort earlier. And Shasta gets confused and thinks, I must have dreamt everything about the lion. It must have just been the cat here all this time. But we know from this story that actually that lion was Aslan. And what C.S. Lewis has done in these books is he has used the Christian story of God and Jesus and he has turned it into an amazing storybook. So in these books, God is portrayed as Aslan and Aslan has protected Shasta. He has scared off the things that might have harmed him and he has also provided him comfort in the form of the cat. And Shasta's doing something that I think we can all do from time to time. He imagines the worst. He looks at the situation around him and rather than seeing some hope, he goes straight to the fact that he thinks this lion is going to eat him. But that doesn't happen. What happens instead is he feels the warmth of a cat on his feet and the sunlight starts to come up. Now, I just want to remind you all that God wants to help you and comfort you in this time and that we can so easily over-imagine the bad things that might be happening when actually, at the time, they seem scary, but God wants to bring good out of them in the end. 
Now I want to share with you a line from one of C.S. Lewis's other books, and this is a book called Perilandra, which is a book he's written for adults and is a sci-fi book, so very, very fun. Um, and that is that God can make use of all that happens, but still the loss is real. And for Shasta, the fact that he can't find his friends, the fact that he is a slave boy who's had a very hard life, for him, that loss is real, that struggle is real. But the truth that we know is that God will bring good from it. He can make use of this. So in these times where things seem really scary, we can all have hope. Know that the sun will come up and that God will be there to help us and bring us comfort in our time of need. Now I'm going to pass you over to the lovely Stafford family who've done an all-age song for us. So if you would please get up off your feet and join us to worship wherever you are, wherever room in the house you might be. That would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you and bye. Hello children, if your parents have received and read the activity suggestions for today, they or you should know what you can do now with this here and this here and this here. And another great thing is happening today because there's waiting someone for you after the service. All children from Daiwos will catch up with Lisa Knight in a Zoom meeting after the service and Dan Besford will meet with all children from Surface, both at 12 o'clock. So parents, download Zoom and click on the link in the email at 12 o'clock. And there's another short info for all families with children. 
you will receive another email today from us um, for a little surprise for next week. But just check your emails. Have a good time now. Thanks, Kirsten. That sounds fun. Um, it's great to see you. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Chris, one of the senior ministers here. And uh, uh, Joy and I had a COVID-19 night out on Thursday, um, by which we mean that we had dinner with some friends and went to the theatre. Well, at least we didn't actually go anywhere, but uh, we arranged to meet up over Zoom and uh, we had a takeaway. Uh, just to be sure on that one, uh, when it arrived, uh, we uh, had hot dishes to put it into. We transferred the food into the hot dishes with a spoon. Uh, we discarded all the packaging, put the food back in the oven for a little while to heat it all up. Uh, we washed our hands before we ate. Um, and uh, we enjoyed it and we chatted to uh, our friends over the meal. And then we moved on to watch um, the uh, National Theatre streaming of uh, One Man, Two Governors with James Corbyn. It was hilarious. If you missed it, they're still streaming it for the rest of the week. You can pick it up. Um, we haven't really laughed quite so much in a long time. And it, it just reminded me of uh, a play which I saw, I think it was Christmas before last, where the company that did the play that goes wrong did uh, Peter Pan Goes Wrong. And it was really, really funny. Um, and then this week, I found a cartoon in a magazine, which you might have seen. Malta, can you stick that one up? Okay, that's good. I don't know whether you can see it, uh, but uh, the cherub is just saying to God, um, have you tried turning it off and turning it on again about the world he holds in his hands? And of course, we know that what we're dealing with isn't actually funny, uh, even though we know that uh, being able to laugh in difficult circumstances is uh, a real gift from God. Now, Christians around the world are celebrating this week in the run up to Easter, remembering the last few days of Jesus' earthly life uh, and uh, preparing to celebrate next Sunday, the festival of Easter Day, the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. But the story of those last few days certainly looks like something has gone most seriously wrong. We're going to pick up the story early in the morning on the day that Jesus is put to death as he stands before Pilate, the Roman governor of Palestine, outside his palace in Jerusalem. Uh, if you've got a Bible handy, you might want to uh, pick it up and find chapter 27. We're going to read from verses 11 to 26. But let's just pray before we do that so that we open our hearts to hear what God might be saying to us this morning. Lord, thank you that you are a God who speaks. And thank you that you've given us the scriptures to speak to us particularly. Open our inner ears to hear what you're saying to us as we read this passage and as we think about its significance today. Amen. So this is Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 to 26. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You said so, answered Jesus. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, what, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus called the Messiah? For he knew that it was out of self-interest that they handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. 
Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, but then instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Jesus has been teaching the people about living the best sort of life by reconnecting with God and following his example of trust and love. He's been bringing healing for disease, comfort for the way down, peace for the disturbed. He's been offering hope, forgiveness and inner freedom. But in the process, he's challenged the power base of the Jewish religious leaders and the ruling Roman authorities. As he declared a new way of giving, what he called the kingdom of God, he's become a threat and his life is in danger. He's been avoiding Jerusalem for a while to keep out of trouble, but then he senses that it's God's time for him to go back. If we read back from the passage we had this morning, we'll find other things that have gone wrong. One of Jesus' closest group of friends, his 12 disciples, has betrayed him to the authorities. That's Judas. No one knows exactly why, but the Bible's clear that he opened himself up to the devil and his tempting, and he turned Jesus in. And once he'd done so, he was filled with remorse. He took himself off and hanged himself. And then Peter's right-hand man, Peter, denied even knowing Jesus, not just once, but three times. Fearing for his own life, Peter let down his best friend. And most of his disciples are nowhere to be seen, deserting him in his hour of need. So here Jesus is, betrayed, denied, alone, and standing between Pilate and the Jewish authorities. The Jewish authorities, who should surely have recognised him as the king or Messiah, that's the Hebrew word, that they've been seeking for centuries, but who couldn't see it for their own imagined sense, ingrained sense of privilege and self-importance. And then there's Pilate, holding the reins of power, but completely controlled by the impossible dilemma of keeping the peace with a crowd on the edge of a riot. His actions were ruled by expediency. Even when his wife speaks words of conscience, advises him to have nothing to do with this innocent man, he still goes ahead with the wishes of the mob. And as if it can't get any worse, the crowd choose a man with a history of murder, insurrection and lies. And they choose him over Jesus, the man of life, peace and truth. The backdrop to the story of Jesus' last days is the Jewish festival of Passover, the annual celebration of the day that God used Moses to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery and into freedom as a nation in the promised land of Israel. That story uh, was the tragic outcome of a standoff between hard-hearted Pharaoh against the God he refused to acknowledge. It was only finally broken by an angel of death bringing tragedy to the Egyptians, but passing over the Hebrew people. And the sign for that passing over was the death of a lamb in every household, with the marking of the doorposts of their homes with its blood. The story of the freedom of God's people in the Passover started with Joseph and his brothers moving to Egypt as honoured guests. But it all gone wrong as things gradually deteriorated and they became a slave people making bricks for Pharaoh. The stories of the world going wrong go back through Joseph's uh, ancestors, his father Jacob deceiving his brother and his father, 
and in all sorts of different ways in the generations before them, all the way back to the first story, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Eden, a world created good and full of beauty and harmony, and where in love, God gave humankind the gift of choice, including the choice to accept God's good guidance and instruction or to reject it. The story of them choosing to reject it led to their expulsion from the garden and their expulsion from God's presence and of the whole of creation being broken by the presence of what the Bible calls sin, the inbuilt tendency of human beings to reject God, to give him a cold shoulder and to put ourselves in the driving seat of our lives. When St Paul wrote to Christians in Rome in the first century, he spoke of the whole of creation longing to be liberated from its bondage to decay and of it groaning as in the pains of childbirth, looking for a new beginning. You'll find that in chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. And I don't know about you, but there's much in this wonderful world that amazes me. Um, I found myself looking much more carefully at the blossoms and the buds, uh, the buds in the garden this week as we have been restricted on where we can go. Listening to the birds in the trees has been a real treat. There's so much that is beautiful. And then I know also that there is so much that is wrong and destructive and unfair and apparently capricious. And I don't understand that at all. But what I see in this story of Jesus standing between Pilate and the Jewish authorities is a Jesus who is deliberately setting his face to go through to his death on the cross and stepping right into all that has gone wrong in the created order. He's not shying away from it, but he's entering into it in all its awfulness. Surely Jesus should have been released rather than Barabbas. Surely it shouldn't have been Barabbas who walked away free. Jesus stood in the place that Barabbas should have occupied and Jesus hung on a cross that should have been for Barabbas. Jesus died in his place and Barabbas went free. Jesus steps into all that had gone wrong and he still does. Questions about why there is evil in the world, about why things go wrong, why bad things happen to good people, about why a tiny virus should create such chaos and cause such anxiety. Those questions have been around for a long time. How much and whether they might be the deliberate action of God or if he's shouting to a world that's ignoring him or how much and whether they've been permitted by him to test us and strengthen us or how much and whether they're the consequences of sinful human activity, or how much and whether they're just the consequence of a fallen and broken world. We maybe could debate for a long time and probably not get finally to the bottom of. But what I do see is Jesus standing in the middle of it all. Jesus prepared to endure the mockery of false accusations. Jesus prepared to go through the agony of death on the cross in order to break the hold of that sin. Jesus standing in the place of anxiety, of fear, of pain, of sorrow, of unfairness, of perplexity and of death itself. Jesus trusting for a resurrection on Easter morning as a sign of hope for a full of life both in this world and in the life to come. What I see is Jesus bringing hope for transformation, bringing peace, faith, wholeness, joy, justice, understanding and life. And then what I see is a challenge about the choices that we make about the way we respond to him. The fundamental challenge is for us to trust Jesus even when the immediate future looks bleak. Whatever the ultimate reasons for a global pandemic or any other tragedy, God's call is always for us to turn to him, always to trust him, always to commit our lives to him and always to find our hope in him. We're called to make choices about our faithfulness to him and challenge to hold on to the truth 
of God's love for us, his good plans for us, and his promise to provide for us and to watch over us. Choosing the challenge to hold on to hope and to live in love. In a world gone wrong, where do we see Jesus today? Today, Are we looking out for him? And in a world gone wrong, what choices will we make today about the way that we live and the way that we think? As we walk through the last hours of Jesus' life this week and remember his gift of life for us, as we endure the restrictions we live under in this difficult and anxious time, as we wrestle with the bigger questions about why the world is not as we know it should be, may we know the presence of Jesus standing with us in our hearts and in our midst. May we find comfort in his love, knowing that he chose to give up his life for us, that we might be forgiven, we might be set free. And may we know the eternal hope of eternal life, which comes from placing our trust in him which can never be taken from us. Should we just pause and pray? Lord Jesus, thank you that you do not shy away from difficult things, but you step into them and in love, you transform them. Give us grace to walk by faith today this week and to trust you whatever happens around us and Lord Jesus as we trust you we pray that we would be bearers of that hope and that we might know you not just for ourselves but across and within our whole world we draw near to you this morning and we pray that you would bring your hope to us afresh for today. Amen. And let's continue to draw near to God as Tom leads us in worship. Make all things. 
see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Thank you, Tom. Each week, uh, we're asking someone to share prayer needs uh, for an area of work or an area of life that they're involved with. And on Friday, Chris interviewed George White, who many of you will know is part of St George's and is the chief exec of Martha Trust, who care for those with profound disabilities. So let's listen to that interview now. George, what, what issues are you facing at Martha Trust at the moment? Okay, so to start with, um, we were in a bit of panic. We didn't know how staff would react. Um, but as time has gone on, our staff have just been uh, amazing. George, what, what issues are you facing at Martha Trust at the moment? Okay, so to start with, um, we were in a bit of panic. We didn't know how staff would react. Um, but as time has gone on, our staff have just been amazing. And they've all come into work and disregarded, really, their own health to make sure the residents are looked after. Um, we also worried about food supplies. And some of our residents are peg-fed, so we, we were really concerned about that. But again, those have held up. And we've had lots of support. Uh, Chris from uh, lots of different people so really we're as good as we could be um, it's just keeping people's spirits and morale up is the, is the major thing and uh, knowing that they're supported throughout. Great um, is there are there some good news stories in that? Yeah well one, one concerns a church member in Graham Peak. Um, Graham uh, has been a volunteer here on maintenance for about six months now but he's disregarded his own safety. And while our regular maintenance man was uh, away on paternity leave, Graham has come in, stepped up to the plate and uh, has made sure everything's working for us around the site. So that's been fantastic. Uh, and our, our chair, Humphrey Clark, found on a Scottish uh, school's website uh, that you can use 3D printers to make masks that we need, which we really can't get hold of because they've all gone to the NHS. A local company have agreed to uh, produce these for us. So they're producing 10 masks a day over the next couple of weeks with my aim that we'll get to about 130 and every frontline staff member can have their own mask. So right. there's, some, there's some great things. We're, we're getting support from all over, Chris. Um, I did think I'd be coming to the church to ask for volunteers, uh, for maybe collecting odd bits of food for us. But to date, we haven't needed that. We've managed to actually uh, survive with the volunteers that we've got and the staff bringing things in. Great. And so how do we pray for you and for Martha Trust and for people working in care generally? Well, the, the first thing is that we pray that actually the virus stays out of our homes. That would be our absolute first prayer. We don't know how people react, staff and residents, if we did get a case. So the first prayer so far, we've kept it out and long may that um, continue. Uh, 
pray that the staff um, don't get too fearful and anxious and that are able to go on doing their jobs and um, being supported by us. Uh, those are, I guess, the main things I'd, I'd really like prayer for. Um, but, but there are two or three prayer warriors in St George's who pray for Martha every day. And I have to say, since they've been praying for us, a lot of good things have happened, even in very difficult times. Great. Thanks very much, George. That's brilliant. Great. I'm going to lead us in prayer now. Um, I had Psalm 91 sent to me uh, late yesterday evening. Thank you, Kerry Banks. And as we move into praying, verse 15 says, when they call on me, I will answer. And as one nurse said this week, this is a battle that will be won on our knees as we cry out to God. So let's do that as we pray. Father, thanksgiving is so important and we begin by thanking you for all who work in care at the moment. And Father, we come to you in your mercy as we face this coming week. We particularly pray for George and the staff at Martha. Father, we do pray that your mighty hand will hold back the virus from out of both homes. Put your angels as guardians around their boundaries and protect them, Father. And Father, we thank you that we are safe in your embrace. We don't always understand, but we look to you. We pray that each of the Martha staff will experience that truth for themselves as they trust in you and place themselves into your hands. And we pray that for everyone who's out there caring for others at this time. And we pray for all our doctors and nurses and frontline NHS staff. Father, keep them healthy physically. And we pray for those who already know the hope you bring, that they may be contagious in sharing that hope that Jesus alone brings with those around them. We pray for supplies and equipment to keep Keep coming through. We pray for those with responsibility for making difficult decisions. Be their wisdom and their shield. And we thank you for so much for those who are going the second mile in supporting others. And Father, we've been praying for people we know who are sick. Thank you so much for those who are on the road to recovery now in these past few days, including Alison, who we prayed for last week. And we continue to pray for those who are sick or in hospital at this moment. And Father, I want to pray into a picture that was shared with me this week. For those who right now are in a critical condition and dying with this virus in hospital. Father, I pray that in their isolation, they will know angels with human faces of people that they know standing next to them. And we thank you for Luigi, Mauro's dad in Italy, who passed on this morning. We thank you that your heavenly hosts were made real. Bring peace and hope and healing, Father. And finally, we pray for ourselves that we may turn our eyes towards Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face that the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. I invite you now to join in the, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Last week, I brought the church challenge to put three things we are giving thanks for each day uh, on a piece of paper and put it up somewhere. Mine are behind me on the door there. And uh, it'd be a great encouragement if you could post some of yours on our Facebook page so that we can be encouraged by those things. So before our final song with Tom, Kirsten is going to bring this week's church challenge. Hello, here comes the challenge of the week. What about reading in the Bible? This coming week is a great opportunity to discover what it's like to read through a whole book of the Bible, um, to experience, to see some familiar and some new st stories just at once. I suggest you to read one gospel. So that means Matthew, Mark, Lucas or John. Um, here you can find out lots of stuff about Jesus' life and which may prepare you for the next weekend, Easter. Or if you're not already fed up with technology, I have another great suggestion. If, since a few days, um, this app is online and free. It's called the NIV Audio Bible with David Suchet, maybe. And then the best thing in this year is not just having um, your Bible text um, on your smartphone, but if you click on one text and play this year. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the... You can listen to the Bible. So yeah, the challenge is read or listen to a gospel every day so that you have finished one gospel um, by the end of the week. And I'm curious to see what new things you have discovered. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my soul this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are stilled when striving cease my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God.
is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me We are in testing times and uh, if you're someone who is questioning what life and meaning and faith is about and you don't have that assurance that faith in Jesus brings, Chris or myself would love to, uh, for you to get in touch this week. We'd be really happy to listen to and engage with your concerns, your questions, uh, messages on, on Facebook or drop us an email. And this coming week brings us to Easter. If you're part of a community, we'll be sending out some resources for you, but this coming Friday is Good Friday, uh, when we consider Jesus' death on the cross and its meaning for us. And that means we'll be meeting for another live stream at 10.30 on Friday, and then at two o'clock there'll be a quieter meditation and songs put out. And then, of course, we'll be coming together on Easter Day next Sunday as we celebrate the event in history that changed the world, Jesus defeating death as he rose again, and get to think about what that means for us. So it uh, doesn't make quite as much sense if we go into Sunday without really going through Good Friday. So do join us Friday and Sunday if you can as we gather together. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've been encouraged. Um, if you're part of a community or a group of friends, you've not already organized getting together online for your coffee with your community, then as Chris suggested last week, why not give someone a phone call and say hello and give them your love. And for kids, um, there's a Zoom meeting at midday. Thanks to Kirsten and the kids team for organizing that. And of course, thank you to our tech guys again, to the three M's, Malta, Marco and Matt. Great job, guys. A final prayer. Father, as we go into our week, would you draw us into your embrace? Would you fill us with your spirit? And would you watch over us and all those we love today and always? Amen. Hope to see you again next week. God bless you and keep praying, keep connecting and keep well. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me our chaos back into water, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, 
shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The king, the king of glory, the king above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I will be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Sing, worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, oh, this is amazing grace. You would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Sounds 
done to you And in your kingdom Broken lives are made new You make us new Cause when we see you We find strength to face the day And in your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away